Hi everyone, welcome to the tutorial about preparing data for 3D printing using 3D Slicer. For those of you who are unfamiliar with what Slicer actually is, it's a completely free open source software package for visualization and image analysis. You can download it from the Slicer webpage and I'll place a link to that in the description box below this video. So during this tutorial, I'm going to highlight just a few features that exist within Slicer, but you can explore other capabilities using the Slicer wiki, and I'll place a link to that in the description box below the video as well. So that being said, let's jump right in. Again, the purpose of this tutorial is to prepare data for 3D printing. So I'll begin with a cone beam CT that a patient had done after dental surgery, and I'll end with a 3D printed model of that patient's left temporomandibular joint. I'll break this workflow up into six key steps. We'll start with an introduction to 3D Slicer for those of you who have never seen the interface before. Then I'm going to load data into Slicer using drag and drop. After that, I'm actually going to crop down my cone beam CT to a sub volume that contains only the region that I'm interested in. Afterwards, I'll use the editor module to create a label map in which I segment out the bone part of that subvolume because I want my 3D printed model to only represent the bone. Then I'm going to create a surface model within Slicer from that label map and save it in a file format that's compatible with my 3D printer. Now, for those of you who are confused by the terminology that I'm using right now, I hope to clarify that as we work through these sections of the tutorial. And on the other hand, for those of you who think you might be bored by certain sections of the tutorial, you can feel free to skip to whichever part you happen to be interested in using the annotations on your screen or the hyperlinks in the description box below the video. So let's start with that introduction to 3D Slicer. Once you've installed Slicer, you'll see a screen like this when you open up the application. Slicer has a modular design, so that's not just a spatial description, it's also an organizational one. Depending on what you're doing or what tools you need, you'll open up different modules within Slicer. And based on which module you're using, the left side of your user interface will change. So right now I'm on the Welcome to Slicer module, which is the default when you open up the application. I can access the other modules by using this drop-down menu in the toolbar above. The first option in this list shows all the modules that exist within Slicer right now. So to date, there's 125 modules listed here. So it's really a wealth of information and tools that you can access. Beneath that are some of the core modules. And beneath that, the modules have been sorted by category so that you can easily find what you're looking for based on your objective. So again, if I pick a module, we'll be using the editor a lot during this tutorial, the left part of my interface changes, and then I can use these tabs to either hide or reveal different tools and features that exist within that particular module. And again, if I change it to something else, the left part of my interface changes once again. The right part of the interface, on the other hand, is where you're visualizing your imaging data. Right now, I'm looking at what's called the conventional view. So the top is the 3D aspect of your data and three slice views are featured on the bottom. I can change this by using the layout icon in the toolbar above. And there's a series of things to choose from. Depending on what you're doing, you'll use different ones. The four up allows you to see all of these four panels adjacent to one another. Um, if you choose to, you can view only one slice. So for instance, red slice only. And if you need to, you can also choose to view the 3D only. So if you're doing an analysis that requires that, you have that option as well. So I'm going to give you a quick orientation about the toolbar above. The first three icons are about loading and saving data. We'll be using the save icon at the end of this tutorial. After that are a series of icons that help you navigate between modules. So you can use the magnifying glass over here to search for a specific module if you already know its name. Then again is the drop down list that allows you to access all the modules. This icon allows you to go between modules that you've recently loaded. And then these two buttons are to navigate back and forth between modules that you've been using. After that are a series of core modules. So for easy access, you can click on them up here. And then the layout button, again, to change the right hand side of your user interface. Then we have some mouse options a couple of different scene views, and then crosshairs. So for instance, if you need to see a very specific part of your data on all three slices at once, you can use that. 
The Extensions Manager is how you customize your Slicer experience, so you can load different additional modules or wizards using this tool here. And lastly, we have the Python Interactor icon, which allows us to launch the Python console of Slicer. So that's just a quick orientation of the Slicer interface itself, and now we're ready to begin loading our data. Like I mentioned, I'm going to use drag and drop to load my cone beam CT, which really is the simplest and most intuitive way to load your data into Slicer. I've saved my DICOM directory to my desktop, so I'm going to begin by locating that. And there it is, cone beam CT post dental surgery. I'll click and drag the whole folder into the Slicer window. Your file doesn't have to be saved to your desktop, you can locate it wherever it happens to be and click and drag it straight from that directory. It also doesn't have to be a DICOM folder, so you can click and drag other file types into the Slicer window as well. In this case, I get this dialog box asking whether I want to load my directory into the database and I'll click OK. And when I do that, the module automatically changes to the DICOM module, which you can see on the left side of my Slicer interface. And this window, called the DICOM browser, automatically pops up. So now my data is uploading into that DICOM browser. And once this upload is complete, a second dialog box will appear. There it is now, and it will give you a summary of the information that you've just loaded. So I'll click OK. And you can see now that I have this new patient in my browser named Anonymous and a new study for that patient named None, which might normally be a date or other information. And all the series for that study will be listed below. I only have one, so that's my Conebeam CT. And when I click on it, Slicer will first check for the appropriate plugins. And once that's completed, I can click Load Selection to Slicer. And it's really that simple. So now my data is loaded into Slicer. I'm going to just switch my layout to the 4-up view so that I can see all the slices more conveniently. And I can, of course, scroll through the data using my scroll wheel or whatever scrolling option you have on your mouse or trackpad. If you're unhappy with the window leveling of the data, then you can change that simply by clicking and dragging. So if I do a left click and drag up and down, that changes the brightness of my data and clicking and dragging left and right changes the contrast. I'm pretty happy with where it is right now, so I'm going to leave it there. If instead of a left click and drag, I do a right click and drag, that allows me to zoom in and zoom out of the data. If you're using a mouse or trackpad that actually doesn't have a right click, you can hold down the control key on your keypad while doing a click and drag instead, and that will have the same effect. And sort of along the same vein, if you hold the shift key on your keypad while clicking and dragging, then you can pan the data instead of zooming in and out. So the last thing I'd like to mention is that if you hold the shift key and hover over the data, so I'm not clicking and dragging right now, then the corresponding views and the other slices are automatically revealed. So say I'm really interested in this region of the axial slice, I want to see what it looks like in the sagittal and coronal views, I can simply hold shift and hover over it, and the corresponding slices to that area are automatically being shown on the views below. Now we've loaded our data into Slicer, we're able to window level, zoom in, zoom out, and pan it around as we need to. So we can go ahead now and start cropping that cone beam CT down to the region that I'm specifically interested in. In order to do that, I'm going to use the crop volume module of Slicer, but I'm going to sort of inform it with the volume rendering module so that I can create a 3D volume rendering of my cone beam CT and then select the region that I'm interested in using that rendering as a guide. So I'll begin by loading that volume rendering module first. And I really have a number of ways that I can do that. So I can search for volume rendering using the magnifying glass, or I can load the full list of modules and find volume rendering from among those, or it's listed as one of the core modules in this drop-down menu here. So regardless of how I choose to do it, I'll click on volume rendering, and the left part of my interface changes. So you can see that the first option here is which volume do I actually want to render. And there's only one choice in that list because I've only loaded one series. So I'm going to turn on the volume rendering for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, none, which is the anonymized name given to my cone beam CT. And it's loading now. There it is. So I'm going to use shift, click, and drag to pan this rendering in space just as I would in the slice views. 
and I'm actually going to use this icon in the top left, which looks like a coordinate system, and that will center my scene view onto my volume rendering. So that's a convenient way to do that. And what will really be useful to me is to see the bones in my volume rendering because I'm trying to model the TMJ. So I'm going to use one of these presets listed in the menu here, which are specifically thresholded and colorized to help you visualize different aspects of your data. So I'm going to pick this one called CT Bone. And when I do that, you can see the bones in the cone beam CT volume rendering. And I'm going to just zoom in here so you can see the TMJ. And you can see there's a little bit of an obstruction to my view, so I'm going to just increase this shift value or this threshold value such that only high intensity aspects of the data show through. And you can see now that the TMJ is really clear. So I can see my TMJ in the volume rendering and this will be extremely valuable to me as I crop. So now I'm going to enable the cropping in the volume rendering module and display the region of interest. So you can see right now that the whole volume is included in the ROI. But as I shrink that ROI, the cropping is visible in the volume rendering in real time. So this really helps me inform which part of the volume that I'm picking during my crop. So I'm going to go ahead and just limit this down to the TMJ. And I'm going to use the shift hover to reveal this slice in the other sagittal and coronal views. And I'll continue shrinking this ROI until it contains only the region that I'm really interested in. So on the superior side, I'll crop out most of the temporal bone so that ultimately my 3D printed model really centers on the TMJ. And you can really see here how my volume rendering is helping guide the region selection. So I'm really able to specifically target the part of the volume that I'm interested in. And now I'm fairly happy with the ROI that I've created. So this is the sub-volume that I want to crop down my cone beam CT to, but I haven't done any cropping yet. All I've done so far is create an ROI that contains the sub-volume I'm interested in. So I'm going to reveal the inputs tab of the volume rendering module. And in here, you can see that the region of interest I've just created is called annotation ROI. There are no other options here because it's the only one I've created. So the name of the region of interest is annotation ROI, and I'll use this name in the crop volume module. And I'll load crop volume by revealing the full list of modules and selecting crop volume from among them. And you can see that the input volume is the cone beam CT. There are no other series loaded. And the input ROI is automatically selected to be the one that's called annotation ROI. So that's perfect. There's no other options in this menu either. And this is the ROI that I just created in the volume rendering module. Now I'm using it to crop. So I'll hit the crop button. And when I do that, a new volume is created that only contains that region of interest. So now I've truly cropped down my cone beam CT. This new volume is called 123456 sub volume scale one. So it's a sub volume of my original cone beam CT. Now we've used the crop volume module to crop down the cone beam CT. So we can go ahead and create that label map in the editor module in which I'm going to segment out only the bone part of the sub volume. Now to be clear in slicer, when I say label map, I mean a 3D scalar volume in which each of the voxels in that volume is a number. And that number indicates the type of tissue at that location. And all these label volumes are associated with a color node that maps the numbers into colors and text strings. So in this case, I'm going to create a label map with basically three numbers. Zero for the background, or the part that I'm not interested in, and the part that I don't want to include in my 3D printed object. And then I'll use two other numbers to delineate the bone, or the part that I am interested in. I'll use one of those two numbers for the temporal side of the TMJ, and the other number for the mandibular portion. Before loading the editor module, I'm just going to turn off the visibility of some of this data. So I'll turn off the ROI visibility in the crop volume module. Then I'll switch to the volume rendering module and turn off the visibility of the volume rendering as well, just so that I'm dealing with a little bit less information. Now I'm ready to load the editor. I can do that from either the full list of modules here or the drop down menu here, or it's actually one of the 
core modules in the toolbar. So I'm going to click on it from there. When I do that, it asks me whether I want to create a merge label map for the selected volume. I'm going to hit apply because that is what I want to do. So you can see that the master volume is that sub volume. It's my cropped image. And then I've created this sub volume dash label. That's my label map. So in the editor module, there are really a range of tools that you can use to manipulate this label map. And they go from simple paintbrushing techniques, so I can highlight the paintbrush and paint directly onto my image. And they go all the way until automated segmenters, thresholding techniques, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to use this undo button to get rid of the blob that I created. And I'll begin by choosing the appropriate label value. So I'll click on this color swatch here, which loads the full list of available labels. And you can see that there are many to pick from. And I know that there's one specific to the temporal bone. So I'm going to search for that in the bar up here. And there it is, left temporal bone number 146. So now I've selected the appropriate label for the bone segmentation. And to carry out that segmentation, I'll use the threshold effect. This is the icon for it here. And when I click on it, basically two values come up, so the lower and upper bound of the threshold. Now, it's clear that the bone comes up as a pretty high intensity, so I'm going to increase the lower bound of the threshold such that only high intensity values are included in the segmentation. And I can scroll through here to make sure this is a preview of the segmentation, which is why it's flashing. And I'm just going to make sure that this preview looks OK. So it looks like I've covered the bone in the subvolume and no really superfluous tissue. So I'm happy with that. And we're going to quickly check in the sagittal view as well. It's always good to check in more than one slice view if you can. And this also looks pretty good to me. So I'm going to hit apply in the threshold effect. And when I do that, the flashing of that label map has stopped. So I've created a segmentation of the bone. But right now, all of the bone is delineated as label 146. And clearly, it's not all part of the temporal bone. So what I'm going to do now is change it such that the lower side, the mandibular side of the TMJ, has a separate label. And I'm going to do that by using the change island effect. The icon is here. And it basically allows me to click on a region and change all of the areas directly connected to it to a different label. Now I'm going to choose the label value specific to the mandible again by clicking on the color swatch here and searching for mandible, then picking label 158 for the mandible, which is displayed here. Now I have the appropriate label, so I'm just going to click anywhere within the lower part of the TMJ and it's that simple. Now I have a label map in which the top part of the TMJ is label 146 for the temporal bone and the lower inferior side is label 158 for the mandible. Now I've created my label map. I'm happy with the way it looks. So I'm going to go ahead and build my model within Slicer. And again, to clarify, in Slicer when I say a model, I mean a 3D surface model. So I'm going to go ahead and do this also within the editor module itself. I'm going to use an effect in the editor module called the make model effect. This is its icon right here. And when I click on it, the first parameter is which label I want to make the model from. So it's automatically set to 146. And the model name is also automatically set to left temporal bone. So that looks perfect to me. I'm going to hit apply. And it's that simple. So now I have a model for the superior part of the TMJ. And I'm going to just repeat this process for the inferior portion as well. So again, in the make model effect, I'm just going to change the label value to 158, which is what I've used for the mandible. It's now saved to the top of my list because I've used it recently. And I'm going to just click on the make model effect icon, which sort of refreshes the effect and changes the model name to mandible. So again, this looks great to me. I'm going to hit apply. And that's all there is to it. So now I have two surface models, one for the superior part and one for the inferior part of the TMJ. I'm just going to zoom in here such that you can really appreciate how the condyle of the mandible articulates with the mandibular fossa, which is this concave depression in the temporal bone. So this is a really unique way to appreciate the anatomy of the TMJ, and I'm excited to see it 3D printed. So I'm going to zoom out here 
Since I'm happy with both my surface models, we can move on to the last step of the tutorial, which is saving these models in a file format that's compatible with my 3D printer. In order to do that, I'm going to select Save from the toolbar above, as I mentioned at the beginning of the tutorial. You can also select Save from the File drop-down menu of Slicer. So when I click on this icon, three columns appear in the dialog box. The first of these lists all the different pieces of information that are part of my Slicer interface right now. To the right of that, we have the file formats in which I can save that information, and finally the directory where I can save those files. So the first thing here is the Conebeam CT itself, then the annotation ROI, the region of interest that we delineated in order to crop our volume, then the subvolume that was a result of that cropping, the label map that we created in the editor module, and finally the two surface models that I need for my 3D printer. So I'm going to use the select all option in order to select all this information and then deselect all of it so that I can pick just the two surface models. Now, the file format that's most convenient for me is STL, but you can of course choose whichever of these formats is most convenient for you. And then I'm going to click Change Directory for Selected Files, which enables me to change the save location for all the selected pieces of information at once. And I'm going to just choose my desktop for convenience and hit Save. And that's really all there is to it. So I'm going to just move my slicer window and check my desktop, and sure enough, there are my temporal and mandible surface models saved as STL files. And this is the information that I'll use with my 3D printer. And this is the final product. So we started with a cone beam CT, and we've ended with a 3D printed model of that patient's left TMJ. I'd like to give a huge thank you to Kitware for printing these models for us. If you'd like to learn more about the process that they used in printing these, you can read about it on the Kitware blog. So thank you for watching, and be sure to check out the Slicer webpage and wiki for more information about 3D Slicer.